uh, session of the festival which it which is titled climate chaos where amitav ghosh will be in conversation with sampath patnayak you've already heard from mr ghosh and also uh, know what he thinks about a lot of things uh, we'll get to hear more from him about what he thinks about the climate crisis he'll be in conversation with sampath patnayak who's a freelance journalist and columnist who last served as the assistant editor with the indian express he has also worked as a business journalist with reuters can i please welcome our two panelists on stage please amitav ghosh and sampath patnayak good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh we in odisha know a thing or two about climate change i leave it at that but even these days climate change is a term that is well known to people from a certain social class in india but even the information that floats around them is unsystematic uneven and unconnected to other forces in society at best people are able to draw tenuous connections between global warming sea level rise fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions and so on this discussion is often dominated by policy experts scientists data tables graphs all of which intimidate the average person this is perhaps where the humanities literature and great writing step in Amitav Ghosh sketches for his readers both the enormity and intricacies of humanity's greatest challenge. In works like The Nutmeg Scars and Great Derangement, he pollinates our imagination and consciousness, drawing from history, philosophy, literature and psychology. We are privileged to have him here today to give us glimpses of his supradisciplinary thesis on climate change that spans across many of his books. Welcome Amitav thank you once again for joining us today Thank you thank you so much Uh I think Amitav we should start uh by uh taking our audience members to where you have taken your readers in the Nutmeg Scars you take them to the Banda Islands the year is 1621 the Dutch have just arrived and you set it up to draw startling connections between climate change and colonialism can you tell us a little bit more about that oh uh, sure i will uh i mean it it would it would i would need to summarize the entire book <laughs> to uh, to tell the story properly but i can certainly talk about how the story begins so the book uh, many of you <coughs> i'm sure have been to indonesia uh to places like bali and so on but actually the part of indonesia that first came into contact uh with european colonists uh, was not these more familiar parts of indonesia but actually a very distant part of indonesia that is uh what is now called maluku which is the far eastern part of um, uh, of uh indonesia it's actually these islands are much closer to australia than they are to java or sumatra and There's one particular group of islands there it's called the Banda archipelago this is a tiny tiny archipelago of islands i mean they're like there's about six major uh, six islands and the biggest of them is less than 2 miles long so it's a tiny tiny corner of the universe on most maps you can't even see the islands they're not even uh, they're not even marked but these islands had an enormous importance in history because they had an amazing tree this tree was the nutmeg tree the nutmeg tree produces both the uh, the nutmeg which we call jaffal and mace which is the outer covering of the nutmeg which is javitri so until for most of human history every nutmeg in the world came from these six islands these islands the nutmeg was endemic to these islands uh, the islands had a very unusual volcanic ecology and this uh, the volcanoes created this kind of forest and you know a particular sort of configuration of climate which nurtured the tree but from very early in human history nutmegs began to circulate nutmegs came all the way from the banda islands to india to china to the middle east uh, to uh, to africa and from there they were taken to europe and for centuries uh, the republic of venice 
had, had a monopoly of the nutmeg trade. So because uh, this was uh, one of the most important commercial uh, items uh, of the Middle Ages, I mean, uh, in uh, 16th century Europe, uh, for a handful of nutmeg, you could buy a house or a ship. You know, the, uh, such was the value. So it was in order to break the Venetian monopoly on nutmegs that uh, the Portuguese kings started trying to create a... Uh, uh, a sea route to the Indian Ocean. Uh, we like to think that you know the European explorers came to uh, uh, came into the Indian Ocean because of our pepper, and uh, pepper was indeed a very important uh, uh, trade commodity. But in terms of value, nutmegs, mace, and cloves were actually much, much more important, much, much more valuable. So within within a few years of Vasco da Gama arriving uh, in the Malabar. Uh, the Portuguese penetrated much deeper with the idea of reaching the Banda Islands, which they did in 1512. From then on, Europeans of every kind followed them, the Spanish, uh, the Dutch, and then the English. And their sole intention was to establish a monopoly over the nutmeg trade. Uh, however, the Bandanese resisted because naturally they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't want to give away their commodity to... Uh, um, a European uh, um, company, uh, the Dutch East India Company. So what happened is that in 1621, uh, the founder of the Dutch uh, Empire in, uh, in, uh, in the East Indies, he was a man called Jan Peterson Kuhn. He decided, literally, that there had to be a final solution to the Banda problem because the Bandanese were resisting too much. So what he did is that he took a fleet of, uh, of ships and an army and he, he went to the Banda Islands and in a very brief period of 10 weeks, uh, essentially the Dutch exterminated the entire population of the, of the Banda Islands. The population wasn't very large in the first place, there were like 15,000 people and uh, about 5,000 were just killed outright by burning their villages and so on. Uh, another 5,000 or so uh, were enslaved and taken to Java. And uh, another, another third of the population fled into the mountains where they died of starvation and disease. And a few hundred managed to escape to other surrounding islands. But, you know, so in effect, uh, the Bandanese, who had been a proud and enterprising commercial people, uh, in the course of uh, you know a couple of months, they were just uh, eradicated from the face of the earth. They were just exterminated. Right. And uh, it was because they possessed this incredible resource. So what happened to the Bandanese is perhaps the first instance of what we might call the resource curse. And, uh, you know, the resource curse is really what is now driving Adivasis from their homelands. Uh, it's what visited uh, the disaster that visited Iraqis because they possessed an incredibly important resource. It's the disaster that befell Libya. And it's the disaster that's befalling the whole world, the entire planet. Once you create this extractivist model of economy, uh, you inevitably exhaust the earth and that in turn is, uh, leads to these other problems that we see around us. So in effect, I, uh, what I really argued uh, in my book, The Nutmeg's Curse, uh, is that today what we are seeing is the globalization of the resource curse. You know, uh, resources being extracted in, um, on, on an unimaginable scale, creating unimaginable destruction unimaginable disruption and uh, you know the next generation is going to pay the price right uh, you used a very important work which we often encounter in uh, in the nutmeg curse which is extermination so was this extermination of man animal and earth's resources at the core of elite european culture yeah, it certainly became very much at the core of uh, elite European culture, uh, starting in the 17th century and really peaking in the 19th century, where uh, Europeans constantly talked about fighting wars of extermination. 
you know, so, I mean, you'll see the Dutch uh, attack on the Bandanese being described by English sources as a war of extermination. And they were fighting wars of extermination uh, also uh, in the Americas. You know, uh, the population of the Americas was reduced by 90% right. within a 100-year period, you know. So those were wars of extermination and they were conceived of as wars of extermination. Perhaps the best known modern war of, ex I mean, not, not the best known, but certainly one of the very early 20th century wars of extermination was fought by the Germans against uh, the Herrero people of Namibia, uh, whom they almost uh, succeeded in exterminating. Uh, another war of extermination was uh, uh, the Turkish uh, onslaught against Armenians. Uh, but, and then of course you have the Holocaust. I mean, there's a direct, uh, there's a direct line, uh, you know, between these wars of extermination. But certainly this was uh, very deeply embedded uh, within 19th century European culture. You see uh, people talking about it uh, all the time, really. I mean, in 19th century sources. Right. So, I, I have a follow-up here. So, is there something intrinsic in European nature or can we consider another lens? Because uh, we might also notice that in the 17th and 18th century, enlightenment and modernity happen in Europe. And they usher in ways of thinking. Uh, the influence of religion retreats, the economic man is being shaped, uh, wealth accumulation perhaps becomes Europe's new religion. How much can we blame for that? Uh, look, uh, I think one of the things we have to recognize is that Europeans were fighting these wars also against other Europeans. You know, so for example, uh, one aspect of these wars of extermination was uh, the great uh, witch hunts again of the 17th century because uh, witches who were, who were ma mainly seen to be women and poor peasant women were also thought uh, of as, creature, as creatures who needed to be exterminated you know and again that word extermination exterminated uh, occurred repeatedly uh, you know in, uh, in uh, the discourse of elite European men who were waging these wars against uh, uh, against uh, poor peasant uh, women in Europe. Right. You know, the word extermination then takes me to another important word in your books, which is the journey of the word brute, how it becomes a trans-species word. Uh, it tells the readers perhaps that there was a whole intellectual and moral project that was fueling these expeditions from Europe on to other places, other parts of the world. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, the most famous, uh, uh, one of the most famous lines, uh, uh, really, uh, Conrad's very famous line is, uh, exterminate all the brutes, uh, you know. And uh, <coughs> the, the weird thing about uh, that, that particular line, exterminate all the brutes, is that it's, it's presented in the, no in the novel as something exceptional, as something unusual. Whereas, in fact, uh, I mean, this concept of extermination was completely normalized. You know, it, was, it had become very much a part of a kind of a, elite discourse uh, uh, upon the world. So, uh, you know, naturally, these, these, kinds of, uh, these kinds of projects become very much embedded within structures of power possibly the case that if anybody else had had so much power, they would also have done the same thing, you know. But as it happened, uh, these projects were pioneered, uh, you know, out of uh, European uh, colonialism. I mean, that's just the historical record. It's not uh, something that I'm making. But I remember reading one of your interviews where you characterized what happened in Banda or in North America as settler colonialism. So, can you please explain for the audience what's the difference between colonialism and settler colonialism? Uh, settle, uh, colonialism and settler colonialism are quite different. Sorry, um, uh, my voice is, uh, you know, is succumbing to the terrible air of Calcutta. <laughs> so. Uh, 
So, we had colonialism in India, you know, which meant that a very small number of English people lived here. Similarly, uh, Southeast Asia had uh, colonialism, uh, which was a small number of French people basically running uh, the colony with the aid of their uh, native allies, you know. Uh, what happened in the, uh, in the settler colonies is completely different. The settler colonies, the most important settler colonies are uh, North, those of North America, South America, Australia, uh, New Zealand and so on. So what happens there is that you have an enormous demographic change occurring. That is, these, these territories become depopulated largely of their native populations, then they're repopulated. So repopulated by an elite class of Europeans. Not all of them were elite, of course. There were many who were also poor or middle class. But beneath them, there comes into being this vast underclass of slaves. This, is not, this doesn't happen in Australia or New Zealand, but certainly uh, throughout uh, in both the Americas. So this project is actually a completely different project from that of the you know, conventional col colonialism that we have uh, in, um, uh, in India or in Indonesia or wherever. And one of the aspects of the difference is that settler colonialism also involves massive interventions in the environment, uh, in the landscape. So early British colonists in, uh, in New England, for example, uh, they felt a great horror of the landscape as it was because it was swampy, there were terrible, for there were forests that frightened them and so on. So they wanted to re-engineer the landscape to look like Britain, like their home country. So that's why you have New England, right. you know, and everywhere in New England you have New Britain, New York, uh, New London, you know. <coughs> the, uh, the, the, the entire landscape becomes re-engineered in to resemble uh, the mother country, if you like. And then as, uh, as the settlers expand westwards, they extend this project also into the interior of America. So you have the huge damming projects. So one of the things we see now is that in India, they didn't, act, although uh, uh, colonists uh, uh, intervened a, a lot in the landscape, it was not as extensive as happened in the settler colonies, which were essentially re-engineered to, like, uh, to look like the home country. So if you look at the terrible irony of it now, the parts of the world that are most affected by climate change are actually the most extensively engineered landscapes. So California, essentially California. So it's almost as if uh, the earth, you know, was saying that, yes, you got away with engineering me for a while, but here, here's me hitting back, you know. Uh, so, uh, California is coming undone. Uh, many of the states of, uh, of, uh, of the West Coast are coming undone. Uh, also, you have uh, southeastern Australia coming undone. But it's also happening to parts of Europe that were extensively re-engineered. Uh, most, uh, uh, most apparently and evidently in the Veneto region, you know, around Venice, which was, uh, 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 was re-engineered from the 17th century onwards. So you have this kind of uh, strange phenomenon where, you know, engineered landscapes are throwing off their boundary, uh, you know, their constraints. But what we have here in India now is that we are auto-colonizing. You know, we are auto-colonizing in... Uh, multiple different ways, that is by accepting wholesale the tropes of colonial, um, um, of colonization, if you like. We are trying to engineer landscapes in that same way. So, in Uttarakhand, for example, right. you know, there's attempt to build all these dams and all these connecting roads, and you see now the result, you know, uh, entire, entire towns are collapsing, you know. Cracks are appearing in the... Uh, I mean, it's the most crazy thing you can imagine, you know, to try and create, like, these highways that will take you to Badrinath and Kedarnath. I mean, you know, anyone who's been to Badrinath and Kedarnath will know that the whole point is that going there is difficult. 
you know it's not meant to be easy it's not meant to be tourism it's meant to be a pilgrimage i mean when i went to badrinath and kedarnath with my parents in the 70s you would see elderly people you know doing shashtang they would lie down and then get up and walk and i mean you know like that they would go i mean <laughs> what is the punya of going there you know if you're just going in a sort of air conditioned bus it doesn't make sense and in order to make this possible you know you become so fervent about pilgrimages that you're actually going to destroy the pilgrimage right you yes. know yes. so basically you you tell us that humans are now geological they have been geological agents for a while they're trying to change the face of the earth the earth is fighting back but i wonder with such tectonic processes happening why does climate change cast such a small shadow over literature or let's say a smaller than expected shadow over literature uh you have discussed the limitations of the novel form uh when it comes to portraying climate change can you tell us a little bit about that sure um so you know it's a question that i have often asked of myself so uh you know basically i began to become aware of uh, these climate issues when i started working on my novel the hungry tide uh in the year 2000 i went and spent a long time in the sundarban and that even back then even 23 years ago you could see the the visible impacts of climate change you know islands were disappearing you could see salt water intrusion uh you could see places that had once been fertile are now being flooded by um you know by sea waters and so on so those impacts were quite clearly visible were becoming visible then i should say but after that it was a series of cyclones that really made these impacts completely visible uh 2009 uh, was a cyclone aila which had a devastating impact on the on the sundarban you know you in orissa and we in bengal have this unfortunate sort of uh, uh, russian roulette you know i mean when the cyclone is coming up the bay of bengal you're sort of thinking uh, oh are is orissa going to get it or are we going to get it you know uh and uh, you know hats off to orissa orissa has really pioneered uh, uh, you know disaster management in india and uh, they've been incredibly effective at uh, uh, you know moving large uh, large uh, chunks of population away from the coast and uh, now they've been emulated by many other parts of the country but not i'm sorry to say by the west coast because the west coast has historically thought that uh, they are immune to cyclones well you know the bad news is that they are not immune to cyclones uh, in fact the dip in cyclonic activity in the arabian sea was a historically specific phenomenon uh, that occurred in the, from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century but it's changing now very rapidly uh so the arabian sea is heating up even faster than the bay of bengal and you'll have noticed in these last few years the number of uh, the number of major cyclones that have hit the west coast one even hit goa uh, it was a very sort of you know a, a low intensity storm but another another cyclone missed bombay and if a cyclone were to make a direct hit upon bombay it would be a catastrophe beyond imagining you know because bombay is actually much more exposed than say bhubaneswar is or puri or or kolkata you know which are actually protected by mangroves and so on so uh you know <coughs> anyway to come back to your question sorry i digress um uh the it was after uh, cyclone aila also you know in 2012 hurricane sandy hit new york so i could say it was as if these things were coming closer and closer towards me before we uh, you know when we were talking you came to orissa because of a cyclone right you know if you've lived all your life with cyclones as most of us on the east coast have you know that it has this kind of epic making power you know you remember things in relation to cyclones you remember you know before aila things were like this after aila they were like that you know uh the great cyclone of 1970 what's now called the bhola cyclone uh, that uh, hit bangladesh uh, was literally the worst natural disaster of the 20th century It may have killed as many as a million people and it led directly to the bangladesh war you know so these cyclones are epical events and i began to ask myself why is it that 
I haven't been able to write about these cyclones, you know. And that led me back, made me think of many different things. You know, I would ask my friends in Bombay, I, well, let me take the example of a couple of very famous artists, um, you know, who were badly affected by one of those terrible rain bomb events in Bombay. You know, there was this terrible flood, they were separated from their child, they suffered, uh, they suffered terribly, you know, for many days. And I asked them, I said, so your lives were completely disrupted by this terrible weather event. H has that weather event entered your art in any way? And not only uh, did they say no, they were actually astounded by the question. You know, how could a weather event enter your art, you know? And yet, if you think about it, our music of the past, our drama of the past, everything was built around weather events. You know, if you look at pre-modern Bengali literature, weather is so intrinsically a part of it, you know? <coughs> but it's completely sort of absent, uh, you know, in contemporary thinking, in, con in contemporary literature, in contemporary art. So that's when I felt a sort of real need to try and understand what is it within the conventions of modern writing <coughs> that resist events like these. You know, we'll take advantage of this lull in the conversation to let the audience know that we will set aside some time for questions from the audience. But was there something specific about the knowledge, uh, sorry, about the novel which was emerging from Europe with its emphasis on, as you say, uh, individual moral adventure? which makes it an inadequate vehicle for, for uh, talking about climate change. In that sense, is poetry a more, rev, more, rev, uh, more susceptible to revolutionary ideas? What would you say? I, I, you know, that, uh, that phrase, individual moral adventure, uh, is actually uh, from John Updike. Uh, he characterizes the, no the modern novel as an individual moral adventure. I don't think that the novel was al always an individual moral adventure. If you look at Moby Dick, for example, it's very much not the case. If you look at the work of Victor Hugo and so on. So, you know, as time has gone by, uh, the novel has become more and more allied uh, to a certain kind of individualism, to a certain kind of uh, interiority, if you like. But I don't think this need be the case necessarily with novels. Uh, you know, I always think that uh, many of you will know uh, John Steinbeck's book, The Grapes of Wrath. Uh, you know, I see many heads nodding here and I'm very pleased to see that. Uh, because actually I think Steinbeck has been more influential in Asia uh, than, even in, um, than even in America. I remember asking Pramodya Ananta Tua, you know, the great uh, uh, Indonesian writer, uh, who were his most important influences? And uh, he named uh, Steinbeck and Gogol. Uh, so, I think there can be many different kinds of novels, but that sort of novel today uh, is, is more and more marginal, I think. Right. You know, talking about the novel, I, I think one of the uh, writing traditions that we have inherited from the colonial power is certain ideas about nature, about animals. The example that comes to mind is uh, how Rudyard Kipling characterizes the tiger, a Sher Khan, or Walter Blake's poem, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. Maybe all this made the tiger the most feared beast in our imagination of the jungle. Perhaps this was not so earlier, but my question is, why aren't we able to shake off these thought traditions? Especially, uh, you know, in uh, 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 English writing, Indians writing in English. Uh, the tiger is a terrifying creature, <laughs> you know. Uh, in the Sundarban, uh, you know, people 
fear tigers so much that they actually, uh, I've met people there who've become paralyzed simply from fear of the tiger. You know, the tiger is, um, the tiger is something sort of so much larger than life, so much larger than, uh, you know, anything that you can imagine that the tiger does strike extraordinary uh, fear into, pe into people, especially who live in the proximity, people who live in the proximity of a tiger. And I think that's one of the reasons why we get these other stories, like the story of Bon Bibi and so on, a story is about establishing a balance, you know, between the needs of humans and the needs of non-humans. Right. <laughs> but is the written word by itself a suitable vehicle to convey the enormity of climate change or should we look at other mediums? One of the phrases I was struck by uh, which you have used uh, is thinking like a forest. What exactly does that mean? <laughs> Uh, that again is a quote rather than right. uh, my own phrase. Uh, look, I do think, and this is the point I make at some length in The Great Derangement, uh, that we do have to find new forms. That purely textual forms actually resist, uh, you know, issues of climate change, of nature, environment and so on much more than visual forms. So I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, television is now dominated by, you know, uh, serials about apocalypse, about, you know, a post-apocalypse and so on. Uh, whereas that's really not the case so much with fiction. Uh, for myself, I, I think it's also important to work collaboratively. You know, uh, novels are a absolutely anti-collaborative form in a way. You know, you sit in your study by yourself and you write and then the book goes out and it's read by the individual reader all alone. So I, uh, for one, have been trying to sort of expand my, my practice. And I, I did a book uh, in collaboration with an artist called Salman Tour, And that then became also an audio book which was performed by the singer Ali Sethi who's now very, very famous because of his song, Pasuri. And uh, then we also made this into a theater performance. I think it's a theater performance, but it could also just as well be a dance performance, <laughs> you know. So we have uh, Malika Sarabhai, the, the one and only Malika Sarabhai here with us. And I hope, you know, it would be my dream to, have, uh, to, see, uh, to see the story adapted by Malika Sarabhai. So there are so many other ways in which we could do it, uh, you know. I think it's very important that, you know, these stories exist not just in one iteration uh, as, as text or whatever, but in multiple iterations, multiple different forms. And as I speak, I'm also trying to make a game uh, from, uh, from that text. Right. It would actually be a dream come true if you and Malika someday collaborate. You've planted the seed now. Uh, Amitav, there is a lot of talk about the fight against climate change. Uh, you have your reservations because you argue that it is perhaps linked with global distribution of power among nation states. Can you explain your position? Well, it's very simple. Uh, you know, when we talk about uh, greenhouse gas emissions, invariably, you know, we talk about uh, individual choices, you know, about what you eat, the kind of car you drive and so on. What we exclude are institutional uh, emissions. Most of all, some, you know, nobody knows how much greenhouse, you know, what is the quantum of greenhouse gases that's emitted because of military activities. You know, and of course, military activities are related to global, geopolit uh, global geopolitics. So, as much as 25% of uh, the United States uh, greenhouse gas emissions is thought to come from military activity. You know, during the Iraq war, in a single, in a single year, they were, using, uh, they were uh, using more petroleum just for the Middle East. More petroleum than Bangladesh, a country of 180 million people. Uh, you know, one of the really weird things is that we don't even have proper statistics on how much uh, 
is how, how much of our greenhouse gas emissions can be ascribed you know, to military activity. You know, we have those uh, numbers for everything else, transportation, etc., but not that. And military activity, by definition, does not come under any of these agreements, like the Paris Agreement. Uh, they were excluded from consideration un uh, uh, under the Kyoto Protocol. So, you know, here we are. There's this elephant in the room. 25 to maybe 35 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions comes from military activity. And we don't talk about it. We're not allowed to talk about it. You know, we're not allowed to know about it. And obviously, this is the part that's heating up. We see today, I mean, effectively today, as Pope Francis said three or four years ago, we are in the middle of the Third World War. I mean, only by shutting your eyes can you just deny that this is the case. You know, the war may be in Ukraine for the time being, but it's not just in Ukraine. Remember the events that led up to Ukraine. There's also the war in Syria, which has left the entire Middle East devastated. You look at the collapse of Lebanon. You look at the collapse of Libya. You look around us. Uh, Pakistan is on, the, uh, is on the brink of defaulting on its debt. Sri Lanka has already defaulted. Myanmar is in the midst of a civil war. You know, we are literally in the middle of seeing all those institutions collapsing around us. And that's why it's a mistake to think of it only as climate change. It's not just climate change. As Margaret Atwood said, it's everything change. That's what we are seeing. We are seeing ourselves in the middle of an unfolding global catastrophe. You know? And somehow, you know, <laughs> we're just pretending it's not happening. I mean, you know, uh, last week, uh, you know the uh, the doomsday clock, right? Uh, the doomsday, the, uh, the, the, the hands of the doomsday clock were moved up. Uh, 90 seconds till midnight. It's the closest it's ever been. So, you know, we are really on the brink. And uh, I, I think we just don't know how close we are because we just get endless happy talk about stuff all the time. Right. Another fact, important factor I think which you mentioned is uh, energy transition worldwide f from uh, coal to petrol, the rise of the petrodollar. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, there's a sort of popular myth about the Industrial Revolution, which is that uh, the switch to coal power happened because coal power was more efficient. In fact, before that, uh, most British mills were run on water, or they were run on uh, they were run on air. In fact, the, there were entire regions uh, of Scotland that depended on water and air power. But the trouble with water and air power is that individual capitalists can't cut them up and store them. You know, it doesn't function as a mode of control. Water and air power are very egalitarian. They flow through the land. So then they started relying more and more on, on coal because coal was a better instrument of control. They could control their workers better uh, through coal. So that's essentially how coal replaced air and water power. There's a wonderful book about it uh, by, a, by a man called Andreas Malm. It's called, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, the name is uh, just escaping me for the moment. but. Then again, you see the same thing in the transition from coal to oil. Because all the great progressive movements in the late 19th and early 20th centuries leading up to even the post-war period were pioneered by coal miners. Uh, you'll remember that. That's been true in our country. It was true of France, Germinal, uh, you know, Zola's famous book. Uh, it was true of the 1880s, 90s. Uh, it, it was true of the general strike of 1919. So uh, the Anglo-American elites decided, uh, no, this won't do. Coal is leading to too much trouble. So let's switch to oil. Oil has many advantages. Uh, in, coal, in a coal mine, you have to bring together large numbers of people who thereby can congregate and form unions and then go out uh, and protest. 
uh, you don't need so many people for running an oil refinery. You just need a few highly skilled workers who are paid a lot of money, so they, they have no reason uh, to rise up in rebellion, as it were. So, you know, that's, the, uh, that's one of the reasons why oil replaced coal uh, as the major source, of, uh, uh, source uh, for the world. But today we are again talking about an, a, an energy transition. So, apart from all the obvious uh, <coughs> uh, uh, geopolitical implications, one of the most important of these is that in 1974, following on the, on the global, uh, you know, there was a huge um, uh, uh, global oil crisis, uh, the Americans negotiated with the Saudis this, uh, this treaty whereby the Saudis would only sell oil to any country that could pay in dollars. So, even for a country today to buy oil directly from Saudi Arabia, you have to pay oil for that oil in dollars. So, this is the petrodollar. And it became an absolute foundation of the American economy. Because of the petrodollar, the Americans were able to print as much money as they wanted. This became a huge reserve for their currency. It became one of the pillars of American uh, geopolitical strength. But, uh, last week, something epical happened. Uh, the oil minister of Saudi Arabia said, essentially, that they would accept payment in any currency, any currency bilaterally. So that's the end of the petrodollar if this goes through. And you have to remember how earnestly the Americans have defended the petrodollar. Saddam Hussein uh, was doing uh, transactions without dollars. That was one of the reasons they got rid of him. Uh, uh, this uh, in, uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela was doing the same thing. Again, you know, out with <laughs> Hugo Chavez. But if this happens, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a major geopolitical shift, and it creates again one of the great uncertainties of the world that we are in, because you shouldn't for a moment imagine that Americans will not defend the petrodollar. How they will defend it, I don't know, but. It's clear now that we are in the middle of an epical uh, geopolitical shift. Right. Uh, a few years ago, I, I don't recall this exact program, but where I've, uh, it was one where I was watching young speakers talk about what they can do to combat climate change. And speaker after speaker had different solutions. Somebody wanted to give up meat, somebody wanted to go and plant in, uh, among the dying mangroves, so on and so forth. And my sense of the entire event was that everybody is a little confused about the starting point. So then the question that came to my mind is, does the fight against climate change need a dandi moment? When Mahatma Gandhi goes and breaks the salt laws, people understand the enormity of the colonial presence, which is not even allowing them to make their own salt without interference. So do we need this clarifying moment, this dandi moment, in our fight against climate change? Um, you know, <laughs> actually the most terrible thing about climate change is that it's not that people don't know. The really terrible thing is that everybody knows. You know, everybody knows. Just how, they may not know exactly how bad it is, but everybody knows that we are living through this disruption. But everybody has also become accustomed to a certain kind of cognitive dissonance, you know, whereby we separate out this knowledge from everything else we know. So there is never going to be that dandy moment because that. If there were going to be that dandy moment, it would have happened way back in 1970 when Jim Hansen told uh, the American uh, House of Representatives that this is what we are heading towards. So there have been, since then, there have been repeatedly many, many such warnings issued. At the same time, I would, I'd like to say that, you know, as soon as we start talking about things as climate related, it gets boxed off. It's exactly what you said right in the beginning that it gets boxed off into this kind of field of expertise. You know, and experts sort of take over that whole thing. Yes, this is the solution you must implement. Uh, we must have the World Bank come in and Im implement the solution. Whereas actually what is so clear now is that we have to undo all the damage that the World Bank and IMF and all these international 
uh, so-called uh, bodies of expertise have done to us. You know, look, look, I mean, they've taken away every kind of natural resilience that we had. In the past, Indian farmers would plant many different kinds of rice because they knew that, you know, there could be problems. I mean, if a, if a, if a cyclone comes and floods the land, uh, there, are, uh, there are flood resistant varieties of rice that can grow underwater f for as long as three weeks. You know, and y your farmers here, uh, farmers all across India had those forms of climate resilience. But those were the things that got destroyed in the process of so-called uh, implementing various uh, kinds of technological uh, <laughs> advances, so to speak. But I think the most interesting work that's being done um, on these subjects today is actually being done by uh, people like Debol Deb, who's a seed conser conservationist. Uh, he has a huge... Uh, he had a, you know, he has a, a organization here in Orissa, a large farm where he cons conserves uh, over a thousand different kinds of rice seeds, which he distributes free to farmers. You know, so in a way, I think one thing that that is happening all around the world is happening. For example, in Ladakh, it's happening in many many individual communities. Is that people are slowly unlearning what experts have told them because the best possible expertise lies often with the people who live on the land and who know how to make the land productive. And those people never figure in the discourse and they prefer not to figure in the discourse because our modes of modern governmentality are such that if we see resilience somewhere, you can be sure that some agent of progress will go there and destroy it. Right. You know, in the name of progress right. and give them some... Uh, some fancy something or the other. Hmm. Hmm. Another challenge that uh, you have identified is when you refer to the work of uh, the French philosopher Guy Debord and you say that now we are living in a different kind of society. Our reality is mediated by images. You talk about his work, Society of the Spectacle. So what is the Society of the Spectacle and why is it keeping us from coming together? Well, <laughs> Uh, Guy Debord wrote his book, uh, um, Society as Spectacle, uh, again, as a response to the great uprisings of 1968. Uh, and uh, what he argues essentially is that we now live in a society where spectacle dominates above everything else. You know, And I think uh, he's been proved absolutely right. I mean, we see today that in fact, um, uh, what matters much more is media hype than uh, what is actually done anywhere. So I think his was a remarkably prescient uh, view. Right. So I think uh, it's time also to allow the audience to ask you a few questions. Uh, people who wish to ask questions, please raise your hands. When you ask your question, just mention your name and your question. I'm sure the mic will travel to you. Can we send a mic here? Yeah. Uh, hi, I have a question, Mr. Ghosh. I'm Kushwan Singh, visiting from Chandigarh. Uh, last year, my novel got published, and I planted 1,500 trees to offset the carbon imprint uh, of, uh, you know, whatever. So, I mean, since my question to you is that what, since it's a writing community, a publishing industry is here, what can we do at, in the writing and the publishing world where we can mitigate this carbon Im imprint? Uh, good question, yes. And a lot of people have, have been thinking about that issue. But look, I think the carbon imprint of uh, the publishing industry is tiny. I mean, it wouldn't even be, I would say, one hundredth the imprint of, let's say, um, you know, the defense industry or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, we can, uh, we can do that. We're, we can plant trees to offset, uh, you know, our carbon footprint in relation uh, to a book. But again, I think mainly we would be just assuaging our own conscience, consciences, really, rather than achieving something really notable in the world. Much more important, really, is to put pressure upon your, your MLA or MP to take more interest in these issues. Hi, Amitabh Malika. 
You know, for many years as an institution, Darpana has been at the forefront of change. So we went solar about 18 years ago. Our first electric car was brought also about 15 years ago. Uh, we have been rainwater harvesting for as long. And I have uh, been an evangelist for personal change. But a lot of experts tell me that what we do as individuals is really completely uh, irrelevant because it's really the governments and the big corporations like Tata's and, and Piramal's and Adani's and Ambani's and that they need to make major changes before anything will shift. What is your comment to individuals or a school or people who just want to individually change? Are we being completely paranoid and stupid? Look, I think making those individual changes is important at some level. It has some effect upon the world, maybe, even if it's a minimal effect. But it flags the issue in your head. It flags the issue in the heads of your students. You know, so it's important at least at that level. And that's why I do think it's important to, to engage with those issues. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, I too have tried to solarize, um, um, you know, my houses, etc. Only to encounter terrible problems because, as you know, it's not easy to do uh, the solar stuff. And it's not easy because uh, I think the government doesn't subsidize it enough. You know, it needs massive subsidies. But on the larger institutional changes in terms of, um, uh, you know, what companies like Tata Steel can do, I think uh, we should have Mr. Chanakya Chaudhary talk about that. <laughs> Go on, Mr. Chaudhary, let's hear. Okay, so you've got me on the spot now. <laughs> no, I think the, the, the issue is very, very relevant and I don't think it is anyone to shy away from the issue in hand. Actually, my colleague sitting next to me, Rajiv Kumar, he heads the operations at Kalinganagar, you know, and he can tell you from an operational angle and whatever we are expanding, how we are bringing in uh, technology to reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, but I'll just give you the essence of, uh, as an organization, what we have set out ourselves for. Uh, yes, we are in mining and we are in steel and we are surely in a hard to abate sector because we have a huge uh, carbon footprint. Uh, having said that, we have set targets for ourselves and we are working very hard to minimize and mitigate these impacts that we are creating because of the operations that we have. Uh, we have uh, uh, to be a carbon neutral company ourselves uh, much before the Indian target, so to speak. As Tata Group, we have taken a target of 2045, but we have very clear roadmaps uh, in terms of reaching carbon neutral, uh, I would say year after year, we have a five-year plan and we have a ten-year plan. We also are looking at technology which are currently available uh, in terms of making the way of or producing steel in a lesser carbon emission, so electric arc furnaces. As we speak, we have a project coming up in Ludhiana where we are putting up an electric arc furnace which will not need iron ore and coal, which will be straight from the scrap which is already available. And even on the water side, what we consume, uh, 10 years back, we used to consume 20 uh, meter cubes of water per ton of crude steel. Today, we are at about 2.4. We have a target to go up to one very, I think, in the next few years itself, uh, within this decade, I would say, and so on and so forth. But having said that, I think uh, we surely have a, a roadmap to reduce not only uh, the carbon footprint of steel making, but to ensure that we have sustainable mining, we have conservation of minerals, and we consume lesser and lesser as we go forward. So that you, the pressure on mining goes away to a large extent. I don't know, Rajiv, if you want to say something from the Kalinganagar perspective, now that both of us are on the spot. So there are no easy answers, right? As you rightly said, it's a difficult subject. But uh, what we have uh, uh, thought through uh, in the initial stages 
use the current technology to the maximum level. So how do we go, rather than having small, small units, how do we go large? So that way, play on the efficiency first. So there is a, a way to say that there will be something as a technology which will come in and correct everything. So just to give you a number, we need to drop down from a two and a half tons uh, of CO2 that we generate every ton of steel that we make in the world to by f by to less than one to be where we should say that we are not harming the planet planet and what Mr. Chaudhary said there is a technology as electric arc furnace we can do that we have already started that in the new ways of working as you have said you went to Jamshedpur or Jamshedpur still is the best in the country but that's not good enough. So how do we drop by at least one to below one ton is the endeavor where in Kalinganagar the state of the art big units you are putting in even in the traditional route can you play on the efficiency can you drop from a two and a half to 1.6 1.7 tons which is doable uh, and we are try we are on course we are trying to do that that's one tiny changes, what ma'am was saying, personal changes, is equally important uh, as we, we feel, as he talked about the water conservation, he talked about mineral conservation. The energy that we use, mankind uses four or five things, you, you, as you rightly said about the defense, but the maximum energy I feel we use is in food. And can we say we will not till the land? And there is already a lot of work happening on cellular fermentation. I would feel chemistry is the answer. We have all forayed into physics and in, uh, but I still feel uh, biology. But for mankind today, I think chemistry, relooking the periodic table, as I say, probably will be the answer. Uh, individually also. So the labs, uh, the Norwegian labs, if you go today, Halder Topsoy, they are the companies, not the SMSs or the Prime Metals or any other big organization that you talk about. These small, small lab companies in the Norwegian region, they have, they are uh, wanting to do research and they have found a lot. So on cellular fermentation, if you read, Google it, you don't need to till the land to get your food today. You don't need that protein. Uh, from uh, animals. So if you can take away that part, so while we may say that material which is where we are all in, uh, the cement industry or the steel industry, the difficult, hard to abate sector, but uh, can you do away with uh, the energy required for food? Can you do away with energy required, required for communication? Because these are the innate things which men can need. Can you do away with uh, energy required for transportation? And you are seeing the Teslas of the world. And if you can drive an autonomous vehicle today, the technology, then you don't need steel, which is routed through today to the, the blast furnace route, as he said. So then can we play there, that also? So we will have some answers in the next five, 10 years. Everybody is working on it. And I think we, uh, the world is moving in the right direction. Right. I think we have just uh, time for one more question from one of Amitav's many readers who just love and adore him. Two together. Two together. Okay. First of all, I'd uh, like to say my name is Purabidas and uh, I'm, I'm a you know, avid <laughs> and uh, big fan of... Uh, Amitav Ghosh, I have read… Ma'am, in the interest of time, just your question, please. Yes, yes, yes. but uh, this is a big moment for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now, I just wanted to ask, we have been… There has been a lot of uh, talk about the climate change and about its effects. It's, uh, but we want to know um, in literature, how… Uh, what is the kind of impact literature will make or can make on climate change? And uh, to say that it has not been in the discourse is not true because we have had great novels which have talked about literature, I mean talked about climate change. So uh, the connection, why is it that, uh, how can we strengthen this connection and how can we make it a movement through literature? That's what I want to ask you. Thank you.
Sir, uh, we all know that it is Warren Buffet of the USA who said, today you are sitting on the shell of a tree which was planted by somebody else long years back. That's your approach. Second, our efforts from Huh. Our efforts from Poland to Paris or Paris to Poland in the matter of climate change have yielded very little because of half-hearted approach of the nations, USA and others who are largest polluters are doing nothing or very le less thing in the matter of climate change, which is a crisis, which can be compared to aid also as described by the American author. Thank you, sir. What is the solution? Thank you. Uh, on the second question, I agree. I think the affluent countries haven't done their share. And until they do, I think it's impossible for them to sell, uh, you know, the program to countries like India or Indonesia or whatever to say, uh, you know, you should cut your um, carbon emissions when they are themselves not cutting their carbon emissions. So. Uh, I mean, that's absolutely the crux of the problem. It, and it's the, in that sense that it's a problem of inequality. It's a problem of geopolitics. Uh, for, in relation to what can the novel do about climate change, you know, I really think there's been a sea change since 2018. I think a lot more books are being written, a lot more art is being produced. I think there's a greater and greater engagement, you know, and I think that's all, that's all good, you know. And maybe it will become a part of a growing movement. Actually, it already is. You know, there's Extinction Rebellion and so on. So there are changes uh, occurring in those directions. Thank you. Right. I think we have to bring this session to an end. Amitav have, has been traveling till this afternoon. He is not completely in command of his voice, as we could see. Amitav, we thank you so much for your patience, for your resilience. Uh, thank you for this session. We need to thank Tata Steel, Malavika, and her team at Gleam Plan for once again hosting this wonderful event and this discussion in particular. Thank you, audience. Thank you all. Thank you.